Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, our scripture reading today is actually, yes, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Because I'm going by the uh, revised common lectionary schedule uh, all the time. Uh, I, I strive to. Uh, and it's really interesting because uh, this passage is very timely. The, the subject, the theme for this passage is justification. And with everything that's going on in our society today, not only in the United States, but worldwide, the concept or the theme of justice is, is everywhere right now. And so I think it's, it's pretty timely that uh, we will today cover Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. But before I start digging into uh, Romans chapter 5, this uh, chapter, uh, let me pray first. Father in heaven, we bow down before you in this portion of your worship our worship services for you, that you inspire all of us, Lord. Inspire the presentation of this message, and more importantly, inspire us so that we can receive that message and change us. And help me as well to deliver your message in an effective manner so that you can change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, before I delve into Romans chapter 5, verse 1, I would like first to point us to a shocking teaching by Jesus Christ himself. He had a shocking teaching in Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 to 9. Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 to 9. Here, you know, it, it all started off with, with his apostles going to him saying, you know, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? And then uh, he he started giving the apostles some admonition. And then when he got to verse 8, Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, he said, And if your hand or your foot, I'm, I'm reading from the English uh, standard version, by the way. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, see, he is here presenting a felony. If, you, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. This is the sentence to the felony of sin. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Wow, that, isn't that shocking? Verse 9, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell of fire into the hell of fire. Now, if we really read this, what is Jesus Christ saying? Do we take this literally? Now, let's take a moment and, and, and let it sink in. What, if Je what is Jesus Christ saying? If your foot causes you to sin, take it off. If your eye causes you to sin, Gouge it out. Tear it out. Now, in, you know me, my mind seems to wonder and, uh, wonder, uh, and, and delve further. Okay, Jesus Christ is saying this. 
you know, if my, my foot, ca foot causes me to sin, I take it out. And if my eye causes me to sin, I take it out. And if my ears causes me to sin, that means I take it out too. Now, there are days when I'm sitting around, I'm not looking at things, I'm not listening to things, my hands are not doing anything, but my mind is wandering around and daydreaming and thinking about things that causes me to sin. So does that mean I take out my brain, right? Take it out because it's causing me to sin. Wow, this is a shocking teaching. This teaching gives us a dilemma, to me anyway. So how then do we solve this dilemma? What is Jesus Christ saying here? To me, it's obvious that Jesus Christ is saying, sin and entrance into eternal life don't go together. Sin has to be taken away. Sin has to be taken away in order for us human beings to be able to enter into life. So, God has the dilemma there. What is the solution? What is the solution? Thankfully, God has inspired through his word that there is a solution to this problem. And it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. See, the problem is sin has to be taken out before we can ever enter into life. So what does God do? What does God do? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him. Who is the him? God made him, we all know, it's talking about Jesus Christ. God made Jesus Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So sin needs to be taken out so that we can enter life. The solution? He made his son who willingly became sin for us. And he willingly took his own life to pay as the to serve as the penalty for that sin so that we will be justified. That's how I see it. This is how it's saying, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We on our own, as Jesus Christ already pointed out in Mark, uh, Matthew 18, there's no way that we can continue cutting, up, cutting off sections of our body that causes us to sin in order for us to be able to enter eternal life. The only way is to be in. The only way that we can be justified, which is Jesus Christ who was made sin, who had no sin, he made him to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do we see God's form of justice here? 
he willingly gave up his life. When we say Jesus Christ died for us, is this just a religious statement? When Jesus Christ died, did he really die? You know, sometimes we never think about these things. A lot of times I myself say, well, Jesus Christ died for me. I am thankful. But if you really look at it, the God who became God-man experienced death for us for three days. He died. He took out. He snu his life was snuffed out because some something has to be taken out in order to eliminate sin. He became that sin for us, even though he was sinless, so that that penalty will be satisfied. And now we can enter life, eternal life, in him, in him. That's God's justice. So with that background, with that perspective, we now go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, see, that's why I gave the, 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 I started off the way I started, because Romans chapter 5, verse 1 starts with a therefore. Therefore, since we have been justified, we need to go back to what I was talking about here earlier. Since we have been justified, meaning regarded as not guilty, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We have peace with God. Is it like a feeling of, wow, I have internal peace? What Paul is saying here to the Romans is, since we have been justified, we are now at peace with God. See, if, if we are not justified, we are at war with God. We are at war with God. God is our enemy if we're not justified. What did uh, the psalmist say in Psalms Chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Psalmist wrote in Psalms 5, verse 5 and 6. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, Lord. You hate evildoers. You know, we've often heard the statement, God hates the sin, but he doesn't hate the sinner. Now, how is this? He said, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Verse 6, you destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. So if you're not justified, you are an enemy of God. You are an enemy of God. But since, we go back again to uh, verse 1, but since we are justified, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, by faith, it's not our own. We have to believe. It's by faith. We now have peace with God. We are now, more, we're no longer at war with God. We are at peace with God. And it didn't stop there. We are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, verse 2, we have also obtained access by faith into, his, into this grace which we stand. So I hope, brethren, by, with all these background that I've been giving, that without justification, we are doomed. But there's also a fact that Jesus Christ died for us, became sin for us. Therefore, now we have access by believing in him, by faith. We have access into his grace in which we stand. And because of this fact, 
I hope if we realize this, we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I hope with all these background that I've given, we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And Paul continues on in verse 3. Not only that. You know, it's easy to rejoice when everything is going well. You know, when we have all these blessings, material blessings, and no problems. I wish verse 3 wasn't there, <laughs> but it's there. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. In our today, let's bring it back to our, what's happening to our lives today. Can we say that the potential for suffering is there with all this COVID-19, with all this protests and violence going around? What is Paul saying here? We rejoice in our sufferings. And this is probably what was happening back then in, 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 in that congregation at Rome. That's why Paul said we rejoice in suffering because of what Jesus Christ has done. We have been justified. We have been justified. And lately I've been looking at the, what's going on in the world you know, uh, it, it's so easy to doubt and to be let down and think that, Lord, why are you allowing this pandemic to happen? You know, and, and then all these things, it seems like everything started to fall on us. You know, you have this pandemic and then now you have this uh, protest go going around all over. And then you have this violence on top of that. And as far as the protests going on, uh, what are we to do as Christians today? What are we to do as Christians today? You know, you have all these protests, uh, you know, uh, they have all their themes, justice, equality, and I was saying to myself, okay, I'm a Christian. Do I just kick back and, and watch all these things? I mean, after all, I am worried about my salvation. I am worried about uh, being right with God. So that's their problem. And, and I'm not even going to address it. I'm just going to bury my head in the sand, so to speak. And... Uh, because, you know, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. I am thinking of a different kingdom. So I'll just let it be. Right? Is that the way? And then I got thinking, I got to thinking, and I said, what would Jesus be doing now under these circumstances? Would he be just praying to the Father? Would he just do nothing and just go around saying peace, peace, brethren, healing. Would he be pro would he be participating in the protests? That is a question, right? Interesting question. I want to bring it to today's relevance. And I was thinking, were there instances where Jesus Christ protested. And sure enough, I went to Matthew 23, verse 13 to 39. Remember all those, woe unto you, Pharisees and scribes. Woe unto you, Pharisees and scribes. That's just, and I said, whoa. You know, there are instances when Jesus Christ voiced out injustice. He did not 
incite rebellion, but he voiced out injustice. What did we learn uh, on Wednesday uh, in uh, the Bible study when Peter was preaching about Jesus Christ? He went about, you know, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus Christ went about doing good. Went about doing good. And part of that is whenever he sees injustice, he points it out. He doesn't remain silent. He points it out to the authorities. He doesn't incite rebellion, but he points it out to the point that the authorities got so mad at him that he allowed himself to be a victim of that injustice. But he did not remain quiet. He voiced it out. And I, was, and I said to myself, okay, now all these protests, is it valid? I mean, do they have a point? So that got me to some digging. And I started looking at the 13th Amendment. I don't know, you guys probably should know the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. And I was, I was kind of shocked because there is an exemption to the 13th Amendment. I'm not going to get into it uh, because I don't want this message to be like a political sounding, but uh, to me, I, I looked at it. It's, it's not a long document. It's only 47 words. But I found an exemption to the 13th Amendment, and I said, whoa, this could open up anyone to abuse that amendment. And I said, wow, there is validity. There is validity to this protest that's going on. And I'm saying, whoa, I, I wonder, I should not be burying my head in the sand. But on the other hand, I should not be joining the rioters and, and the violence people. But if the opportunity arises, we need to voice it out. Just like Jesus. But anyway, uh, that's getting on the side. If you want to look this up further, uh, you can dig in. But the point is, Jesus Christ in his time always did good. And if there is an injustice that needs to be brought out, he's, he brought it out without inciting violence. He brought it out. Again, going on to verse 4. Why do we have sufferings? You know, I ask all these things. Why, Lord? Why do you allow COVID-19? All this, all these uh, hardships. I mean, I, 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 my wife and I, we talk about Mrs. Rogers, where Dan can't even visit her because of the COVID-19. And there are instances where uh, victims of COVID-19 that are in the hospitals, they die alone. Their, their, their relatives can't even visit them. And I'm saying, Lord, why are you allowing all these things? Of course, we know that God always is loving and he has a purpose and here in verse 4 Romans 5 verse 4 let's go to 3 first not only that but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance suffering produces endurance you know uh, endurance is not something that we can develop on our own by, by just reading books. I mean, 
would you become an enduring person just by reading books and theory? And I said, okay, I, I know all about it now. Now I'm an enduring person. The only way you can develop endurance is to experience it and to be put into situations where you have to have endurance. But the good news is, it is not our endurance only. It is the endurance that Jesus Christ produce, uh, uh, empowers us with. It is by the power of Jesus Christ that he will, be, he will produce endurance in us and he will produce character in us. And with this endurance and character, hope is produced. And so we need to go through all of this trials and sufferings in life. It's so easy, especially for me, to think about Christianity and abundance, prosperity, the good life, no problems. But I always forget that Jesus Christ said, if you come after me and I suffer, you will also suffer as I did. And scriptures like this. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. In verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. God's love has been poured out into our hearts. How? How does God pour out his love into our hearts? Well, for one, he pours out the knowledge of the love of God through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Remember our, my introduction, my shocking introduction, we are hopeless on our own. We, we, never, we won't ever have on our own a hope of, eter of, of entering eternal life on our own strength, on our own intelligence, on our own talents. No way. Because if my mind causes me to sin and I cut out my brains, I'm dead as dead. but the atoning work of Jesus Christ. He gave up his life. God himself, the creator of everything, gave up his life for us. That's the love. That's the love of God. How else can he pour out his love for us? He gave us his inspired word so that we we can't just go anywhere and, and listen to people's opinions. He gave us a standard through his inspired word. And through his Holy Spirit, we can understand. We can understand his love. How else? Through an inner, what else? How can we know his love for us? With the Holy Spirit, we will have an inner an inner awareness of the presence of his love. And I'm pretty sure all of you know what I'm talking about. Not too many will understand that. But if you are guided by the Holy Spirit, you will have that inner peace that you know, you know that God loves you. You know. You will, I, I, I can't necessarily say feel, but there's that awareness of the love, the presence of his love. And to further uh, encourage the Romans and to us too, because it's so easy at times like this, it's so easy to say, you know, uh, all these things are happening, all these problems are happening. Maybe, uh, because we're sinners, that God is, is kind of getting frustrated with us and, and he's just allowing all these problems to happen. But in verse 6, he said, no, 
That's not the case. Because while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, uh, it's so easy to say, well, Christ died for, for the righteous people and, and the people that, goes, that go to church and that people that pray all the time. What is this verse saying? The right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For the ungodly. Verse 7, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though some might. And, you know, some uh, strong people may even die for good people. For good people. That's what it's saying here in, in verse 7. But God shows his love for us in verse 8 in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in a situation where we need to cut off our eyes, we need to cut off our hands, we need to cut out our brains in order to enter life, he died for us. He said, no, you don't need to cut out your brain, your eyes, your hands. I will cut out my life for you. I will cut out my life for you. So since, therefore, we now have been justified by his blood. Verse 9. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Ooh, there is such a thing as the wrath of God in the Bible. But don't worry. Jesus Christ took care of that for us. I hope this sinks in, brethren, the kind of salvation we have that was given to us by his grace. By his grace. For if we were, ooh, here's that word again. Verse 10, for if we were enemies, ooh, we were enemies of God at one point. For if we were enemies, we are now reconciled to God again by his death. By his death. Much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Over and over and over again, I hope it sinks into us the magnitude of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse 11, more than that, then, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. We were enemies at one point. Now we are no longer enemies with God. We are at peace with God. We are at peace with God. So, I started off with a shocking teaching. And in conclusion, I want to end again with a shocking statement. You know, being owned by someone as a servant is terrible in most cases. But there is an instance where this is not a bad thing. Ooh. Everybody's probably saying, what a shocking way to end a message. Is this even biblical? Is this even biblical? Well, let's go to Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. 
Romans 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For you, 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 except me, have sinned. Is that what it says? All, everyone. You mean including all for Christ, Santa Maria? Oh, this can't be. I mean, all should not include us, right? So, no, it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, verse 24, the same all are now justified by his grace as a gift, as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's so quick to read by redemption. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look up what the word redeem means. What does redemption mean? When you redeem something, redeeming something is paying the price for that something that owes a debt. If you want to redeem something, you pay the price for that something that has a debt. And in return, you will own that something. That's what redemption is all about. Jesus Christ redeemed us. Therefore, Jesus Christ owns us. Jesus Christ redeemed us. Therefore, Jesus Christ owns us. If you want to verify, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. You can write it down because there's several. Galatians chapter 2.20, Galatians 5.24, Romans 8, 9 to 11. Jesus Christ owns us. But what could be better than being in a position of being owned by the epitome of justice himself? What could be better than having a position of being owned by the epitome of justice himself. Because if we are owned by the maker or the, the embodiment of justice, he will form us into people of justice. He will form us into people of justice because we are justified in him. Amen? We are justified in him. Father in heaven, again, we come before you to ask you to help us really chew this message that we heard today and realize your grace, your form of justice, so that you can form us, and so that we can allow ourselves to be molded by you, Lord, to be people of justice. We can never make it on our own, but we know that because of you and by your presence and by your empowerment and by you being in us, we can be your instruments of justice and peace. We pray it all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.